the story of Emma Lazarus, Liberty's voice. Um, all of us at the museum at Eldred Street feel a special connection to the writer and poet Emma Lazarus. Um, part of the museum's mission is to tell the stories of Jewish immigrants from Eastern Europe who made new lives on the Lower East Side in the late 1800s and early 1900s. And guess what? Um, Emma Lazarus told those stories too, um, but she did it about a hundred years before the museum even existed. So that's one way she was amazing. And you'll learn lots more about her in just a little bit. Um, before we begin, I wanna share a couple details about the program. We're gonna begin with a reading of the book then we'll learn more about Emma Lazarus's real life. And then we'll do a short poetry activity. Um, during the story time, your microphones will be set on mute. If you have a question, you can ask it in the chat feature, which you can find at the bottom of your screen. Or you can raise your hand. You can wiggle your hands. And then we'll see you. And um, we can ask you to unmute yourself to ask your question. And just as a reminder, we are recording today's program and we'll be posting it on the, on the museum's YouTube channel. So if you don't wanna be seen, we encourage you to turn your video off. You'll still be able to participate in the program and ask your questions in the chat feature, but you won't be visible. Um, you can do that on the bottom of your screen too. And now I think we're um, ready to begin. I'm really excited for today's program because it's being led by Alex Dallaire. She's the museum's living history consultant. She's worked with us as a costumed interpreter, and she's also an actress. And so without further ado, here's Alex. Hi, everyone. My name is Alex Dallaire, as Nancy shared. I hope you all can see me. Um, if no one can see me, please wave your fingers at the camera, but I think, I think you can. I just pinned my video so you can see me. Um, I'm Alex, I'm so happy to be here. As Nancy shared, I work as a living history consultant with the museum at Eldred Street, which means that I play historical figures, um, including Clara Lemlick. So some of you may be joining from seeing our last story time about that amazing historical figure. And today we're reading about another amazing female histori historical figure. And her name is Emma Lazarus. And Emma is very connected to the Statue of Liberty. So today we're gonna be talking a lot about Emma Lazarus, but also her connection to the Statue of Liberty. And some of you might already know what that connection is, but we're gonna talk about it together today. And as you can see on our screen, um, we're gonna be time traveling. So what does that mean? We're gonna be <laughs> talking about this real historian and going back in time through our story called the story of Emma Lazarus, Liberty's Voice. At the very bottom of the screen, you can see a picture of um, the logo for the museum at Eldridge Street. So before we get started with our read aloud, I wanted to ask you all a question and that's gonna happen on our next page. So what does the Statue of Liberty mean to you? So as I mentioned, Emma is very connected to the Statue of Liberty. So I'd love for you just to think about what the Statue of Liberty means to you. Some of you may have actually seen it in person. Um, the Statue of Liberty, as, as most of you know, um, sits at the end of the New York City Harbor. It is this amazing symbol of hope and joy for many people. And I just want you to think about when you've seen it, maybe in person or you've seen pictures of it, this beautiful statue with this beacon of light, um, what it means to you. So when you have an idea of what it means to you, if you can just put your hand on your head. I see some of you have some hands on your head. Would anybody like to share one of your ideas? You can put it in the chat box or if you're brave enough, I hope you are, um, you can share it um, verbally with me and you can unmute yourself. So I see somebody wrote in, the Statue of Liberty means welcoming to the United States of America. Thank you so much, Lee. Um, Nancy wrote, it rep represents welcome to me. I can take two more if somebody else wants to share in the chat box or verbally. Um, Megan wrote hope, but that hope is often broken. Oh, Megan. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Yeah, hope can be really complicated. Anybody else wanna share? Oh, 
All right. Well, we will keep talking about the Statue of Liberty. Oh, I see Lena wrote, makes me happy. Yeah, the Statue of Liberty brings me a lot of joy as well. Um, so we'll keep going, but as we continue on our program, I bet this will give you more ideas. Um, so the next page is really gonna start our story time together. So this is the cover of our book. Um, Nancy showed it to you earlier. Um, the story of Emma Lazarus, Liberty's Voice, a biography of one of the great poets of American history. So as you can see on the cover here, the one I'm holding around the screen, this is a picture of Emma. And Emma has this pen to her lip, like she's really contemplating or she's really thinking. Can you give me a contemplative face? Yeah, really taking it in. Um, and she's got this piece of paper and now we know she's a writer. We know she's a poet and we're gonna talk more about that. And we see all around her, all of these like really colorful spirals. That's I think the author whose name is Erica Silverman and the illustrator, um, her name is Stacy Shewitt. They're trying to really show you her imagination, how active it is. And her imagination is telling us all about the people that she thinks a lot about, these immigrants and um, people that move from one country to another. And these immigrants are all on this boat and they're all looking out at the Statue of Liberty, um, just like we were just talking about together. And so first of all, we wanna thank so much before we continue, thank you to Penguin Books um, for allowing us to feature our story today of Emma Lazarus, and um, we wouldn't be able to do it without you. So here is the beginning of our story. So, Emma Lazarus loved to learn. She had a passion for words and a hunger for knowledge. This passion would one day make her the voice of liberty. And liberty, as you can see here, is a big word that we talk so much about. And liberty is the state of being free to act or think as you wish. But back in 1849, when Emma was born, people believed learning was not ladylike and that girls who use their brains too much would actually become ill. Fortunately, Emma's father did not agree. And because Moses Lazarus was a well-to-do sugar refiner, he brought tutors into his home for Emma and her siblings. So this is a picture of Emma and one of her sisters with her father and one of her tutors or a teacher. So we know that Emma actually was schooled at home and that her father's library became her schoolhouse. Um, so this is her learning from home. So growing up in New York City's bustling Union Square, Emma learned from her books as well as from the world around her. Most of all, from the time she was very young, Emma loved poetry. Ooh, so we talked a little bit about poetry already. So what is a poem? A poem is a collection of words expressing an idea or an emotion. And sometimes it's in a rhythm. And like Nancy told you, we're actually gonna write one later today. So poets gave words such power. <sighs> How she wondered, could she ever learn to write like that? Then one day while reading a book by the popular author, Ralph Waldo Emerson, she came upon some words that seemed to speak directly to her. Words that spoke of listening to the whisper of the voice within. She listened and from somewhere deep within, words grew and images took shape. Emma began to write. And so we see Emma looking out the window and we can see Union Square. Um, Union Square looks a little bit different today than it did then. Uh, much smaller buildings. We can see people um, in horse carriages, people dressed in old tiny clothes. And we again can see Emma's imagination at work with all these spirals and her writing and her desk piled with books. Emma found inspiration everywhere. She filled up one notebook after another with poetry. She wrote of her grief at the death of a friend, the heroicism of a civil war general, and the beautiful Greek goddess Aphrodite rising from the ocean. She carried her notebook wherever she went. She took it to the family summer house in Newport, Rhode Island. While her brother and five sisters ran and played, she wrote and rewrote. And so we can see Emma, she's writing in her notebook feverishly, and next to her is this big basket of books. And all of her siblings are playing. They have all these kites and they're playing in the sand, but we can see Emma's imaginations at work with all those spirals as she's coming up with ideas to put onto paper. She had her notebook with her when she visited the 100 year old synagogue built by Spanish and Portu Portuguese Jews who had come seeking safety and freedom. Refusing to betray their religion, they had left their homelands, not knowing where they would go or how they would survive. Among them was Emma's many times great grandmother. Emma stood in the shadowy light of the old prayer house and she imagined how they must have felt. She listened to a voice, a whisper within. Words grew, 
images took shape and she wrote, what prayers were in this temple offered up, wrung from sad hearts that knew no joy on earth, but these lone exiles of a thousand years from the fair sunrise land that gave them birth. So I don't know if you've ever had this experience where you've been in a space and for whatever reason, it just makes you remember your history, makes you remember your ancestry, where you came from. And Emma has this really close connection to the synagogue because her family came through here and they helped build the synagogue. And she's looking out and as she's in the space, her imagination is going and she's thinking about all the people that came before her, including exiles um, or people who were separated from their home or native land. So remembering her own ancestors who were immigrants themselves. Emma's notebook filled up with poems. But were they any good? Nervously, she showed them to her father. Moses Lazarus was pleased. His daughter had talent to encourage her. He had a small book of her work printed. Poems and translations by Emma Lazarus, written between the ages of 14 and 17. They were all distributed to her family and friends. The family was proud. Their Emma was a poet. Editors at a publishing company agreed. The following year, they published her book for a wider audience. Poetry continued to spill from Emma's pen. So we see Emma with her father standing outside of the bookstore. And all of her books are being sold in the shop window. And we can again see her imagination going, um, all this excitement about her books and her poetry. One winter evening, Emma went with her parents to a dinner party guiding her across the room toward a white haired gentleman with wise, penetrating eyes. Her father announced, Emma, I want to introduce you to Mr. Rolf Waldo Emerson. It was the famous author, the one whose book had taught her to listen from within. He greeted her politely. Emma soon found herself speaking comfortably with Mr. Emerson. Amazingly, he listened to her, a girl of 19 with genuine interest. She told him she had published a a volume of poems. I'd like to read it, he said. So we can see everyone at this big party and um, a woman playing the piano, people listening to music, and we can see Emma talking to Ralph Waldo Emerson, and we can see his penetrating eyes as he's taking um, her story in and all about her, her poetry. Emma mailed Mr. Emerson a copy of her books. Two weeks later, she received his response. My dear Miss Lazarus, I have happy recollections of the conversation at Mr. Ward's that I'm glad to have them confirmed by the possession of your book and letter. So we can see Ralph Walter Emerson reading her poetry. Emma was flushed with happiness. That means she was blushing. Mr. Emerson liked her poems. Hmm. Or was he just being kind? And why hadn't he said anything critical? So that means why hadn't he told her that something that wasn't working? Why didn't she give her advice on what to work on? Emma needed him to be honest, to point out the failings in her work so she could learn. So she wrote back, I should have been pleased if you had marked passages in my poem that you, that you, that, that you disappointed you. So I would like to correct them as much as it is in my power. So she wants him to give her advice on how to make things better. Once again, she waited. Would Mr. Emerson be willing to teach her? His next letter brought the answer she hoped for. I should like to be appointed your professor, you being required to attend the whole term. I should insist on large readings and writings. So he's teasing her and saying, okay, I'll be your teacher and I'm gonna give you lots to read so you can be a better writer. And we can see Emma pouring over his letter in excitement. Emma was thrilled. She read all the books Mr. Emerson recommended, paying careful attention to his advice. She pushed herself hard, cutting words, writing and rewriting. One poem and then another was accepted by a magazine. Her second book was published and then her third. Mr. Emerson, the young student, was growing up and making a name for herself. In addition to poetry, Emma wrote essays and book reviews. She attended museum events and plays and concerts. In a letter to a friend, she said, I don't know when I've been so interested in people and books and art and music, everything that's to be enjoyed. Emma's writing became a regular feature of the century, the most widely read magazine in the country. The editor and his wife were among her dearest friends. They introduced her to a politician, William Everett, who invited her to a mass protest rally. This event would change Emma's life and infuse her writing with new purpose. 
So we see Emma sitting on her couch with her cat. And again, her imagination is going about all the people and things that she's been interacting with in museums and friends she's been making. And again, she's got her pen at her lip contemplating like she did at the very beginning of the book. One evening, Emma entered a hall. Oh, I'm so sorry. One evening, Emma entered a hall thronged with all kinds of people speaking many different languages. So that means it was packed with all these different people and tension filled the air. Mr. Everett's took the stage. The Jews in Russia, he announced, had recently become victims of terrible violence. He described pogroms. So pogroms are violent riots that are aimed at an ethnic group, often at Jewish people. He described these pogroms, raging mobs, roving from town to town, beating and killing Jewish men, women, and children, burning down their homes, stealing their belongings. Emma listened. She was shocked and sickened. She had believed that hatred and violence against Jews were things of the past. Now she felt called upon to defend her people. Emma wrote newspaper articles denouncing the pogroms. So we can see Emma in the front row here and she's got this very concerned look on her face and she's got a piece of paper in front of her and she's again, has her imagination going as she's thinking about all these terrible things she's heard of all these people that are really struggling and people's homes burning down. Then she went to visit the victims of violence, Russian Jews who were pouring into the New York City Harbor seeking sanctuary. So that means they're seeking a place of safety and protection. She saw hundreds of refugees, hungry and scared, crammed together in four temporary tar-covered barracks on Ward's Island. There was no running water, the bread was raw and doughy, and the soup had worms. Children played in piles of garbage. Outraged, Emma wrote an article exposing the frightful conditions. So here's Emma, and we can see her looking out at all of these new immigrants, these new refugees that have just arrived, and she has this look of worry on her face, again, sort of thinking about what can she do? And we know what she does is to write an article to try to make change. She brought food and clothing. She set up English classes. She organized groups. She raised money. She met with government officials. She helped to start a trade school. But not everyone welcomed the newcomers. Some, blaming immigrants for crime, disease, and poverty, called for new laws to keep them out. Emma worked even harder to change these attitudes. Suddenly, her writing was fueled by the anger at this injustice, pride in her heritage, and hope for a better world. New poems, plays, and articles spilled from her pen at a furious pace. She wrote, until we are all free, we are none of us free. So we can see Emma here in the corner, and she's teaching one of the students. She's teaching in these trade schools, and she's trying to help everyone at this time. And again, we can see her ideas and her imagination going of how can she do more. Emma decided to meet with Jewish leaders of England to talk about the Russian Jewish problem. She had since childhood dreamed of visiting England, France, and Italy, of seeing all the places she had read about in books. So accompanied by her sister Josephine, she sailed for Europe. They traveled across England and Italy, writing enthusiastic letters about the places they visited and the people that they met. On the return voyage, Emma's ship sailed through New York Harbor. Here she was, arriving along the same waterway as the immigrants who came carrying everything they owned, uncertain of the future, not knowing even the language of their new home. How fortunate she felt, greeted by friends and family, eager to share delightful stories of her happy adventures abroad. How important that her dear homeland continue to welcome its immigrants, that it strive to live up to its ideals of equality. So we can see Emma um, looking out on the um, looking out from the boat, just like we saw on the cover before. People looking out at the Statue of Liberty. Here's Emma looking out, and as she's looking out, she can see New York City Harbor, and she's thinking about all of these new people that were coming here, just like her. Except she's not a newcomer, but she's imagining being in their shoes and thinking about what it's like to be them as new immigrants. Piles of letters awaited Emma. One from Mr. Everett's. And it said, France, he wrote her, had sent the United States a massive statue called Liberty Enlightening the World. But the statue needed a base, and a base was expensive. He was chairing the Pedestal Fund Committee and holding an auction to raise funds. Would she please write a letter about the statue to donate to the event? Oh, I am sorry, but I cannot write to order, she wrote back. Poetry must come from the heart. 
Everett did not give up. He sent a committee member, Constance Carey Harrison, to Emma's home. Harrison pleaded with Emma. Emma remained firm. A poem written to order would be flat. Harrison pressed on. Think of, think, think of that goddess standing on her pedestal down yonder in the bay and holding her torch out to those Russian refugees of yours. Emma sighed. The auction's next week. Even if I wanted to, I would never be able to write a poem so quickly. So we can see this picture of Constance Carrie Harrison trying to convince Emma and Emma looking very worried because she doesn't think that you can just write a poem to order. Meaning you can't just write a poem just because someone asks you to. You have to write a poem because you feel it because it's in your imagination. But Emma was stirred by Harrison's words. She pictured the immigrants coming into New York Harbor for the first time, their eyes alighting on the statue called Liberty. So meaning their eyes are seeing the Statue of Liberty. In newspaper articles, it was always being compared to the Colossus of Rhodes, a famous Greek statue, male, overpowering, meant to frighten away intruders. Liberty was massive and powerful too, but Unlike the old Colossus, she seemed to be holding up her torch to light the way to welcome the newcomers. <sighs> Emma set down a title, the new Colossus. So Colossus means a giant statue. Then she listened to the whisper of the voice deep within. Words grew, images took shape. She wrote, not like the brazen giant of Greek fame, with conquering limbs astride from land to land. Here at our sea-washed sunset gate shall stand a mighty woman with a torch whose flame is the imprisoned lightning. And her name, Ooh, Emma stopped. What was the right name for her? So we see Emma thinking about all these different images of the Statue of Liberty and these new immigrants. She's trying to think about what should the name be? Emma thought about the immigrants she had met on Ward's Island. They had known so much fear and suffering. They needed to be held and welcomed, comforted. If this statue was to have a name, it should be Mother of Exiles. From her beacon hand glows worldwide welcome. Her mild eyes command the air-bridged harbor that twin cities frame. Hmm. And if the statue spoke to the world, what would it say? Emma listened and she wrote, keep ancient lands your storied pomp, cries she with silent lips. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. The wretched refuse of your teeming shore, send these the homeless tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. So story pomp, that means when she's talking about these displays of importance. So she's saying, let's welcome everyone, no matter where they come from, no matter how wealthy they are, no matter where they come from, who they are, all are welcome here. We will welcome everyone with open arms and they'll know they're welcome because of this light that I shine from my torch, welcoming them. Emma set down her pen. She had done it. She had poured her hopes and her dreams for the immigrants into the poem. Perhaps it would do some good. And so we see the Statue of Liberty and she's kind of smiling. It's like she knows that her and Emma have a secret um, that they wrote this poem together. The end. So I'd love to share with you um, some images of the real Emma and some of the historical connections to her. So this is a picture of the real Emma Lazarus. This is an engraving. Um, so we can see Emma um, sort of silhouetted. Um, she looks a lot like the cover of our story. She's wearing the same headband, it looks like. I think she's missing her pen in this picture, close to her lip, always thinking, but we can imagine her in her mind. She has her imagination going. Um, just like we heard in our story, Emma was always creating. She didn't just write the new Colossus, her poem, but she wrote countless other poems. She did translations of German and French poetry as well. She published multiple times during her lifetime, including also a play that she wrote and also um, a novel that she wrote as well. But Emma is certainly most famous for her poem, The New Colossus.
This is a picture of a 19th century engraving of Union Square where Emma and her family actually lived, um, where Emma grew up. So again, this looks a little bit different than probably the Union Square we all think of today, but we can see this big fountain in the middle, this garden, which is a lot like the Union Square we have today and smaller buildings. Um, but this is what Emma would have seen from her window at this time. This is a picture of where Emma actually wrote the new Colossus. We have to thank Rachel, one of our museum at Elder Street staff, who took this picture for us. <laughs> um, this is where Emma lived um, on West 10th Street in Manhattan. So this is a brownstone on the left where Emma actually wrote her poem. And as you can see um, on the building, there's a small blue circle, which tells us this is such a big connection to Emma. It says Emma Lazarus, the years of her life, 1849 to 1887. She only lived to the age of 37. Um, she was a poet, essayist, and humanitarian who lived here. And then they give this, the famous quote from the Statue of Liberty um, from her new Colossus, um, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses, your name to breathe free. Um, as you saw in the book, and we talked so much about this, she was always contemplating with this pen by her lips. So I thought it was really important to show you some of the writing utensils, which are so different than the ones that we use today. She would have used a feather um, to write or an ink pen that she had to literally fill up herself with ink. Um, so this is, um, you can see some of the writing increments, um, as well as the ink bottle that she would have used to write all of her beautiful stories and, and, and poetry. And you can imagine as she's writing, it's very um, liquidy as it comes out of the pen. So every time she's writing, if she wants to write really quickly, she's got to blow on the page and make sure it dries before she can keep going. This is a manuscript of the New Colossus. So we can actually see Emma's beautiful script, um, her um, beautiful cursive that she wrote her beautiful poem on, or what she called a sonnet. Um, so almost like a love letter to the Statue of Liberty. Um, funny and funnily enough, she had actually never seen the Statue of Liberty when Emma wrote the New Colossus. It was actually still in pieces at a Paris warehouse when she wrote it. Um, but as we know, she was so inspired by the time and what was happening with new immigrants, she wanted to find a way to contribute. And so that was through, but we know she was so talented at, which was her writing. This is a picture of Ralph Waldo Emerson, which we talked so much about. So he was a famous writer at the time and certainly someone that really inspired Emma, as you saw in the book. Um, she connected with him at these parties. That actually happened. Emma used to love to socialize with writers and artists. And at these parties, she would often meet these philosophers and artists like Emerson. And Emerson happened to be someone, as you know, was such a huge inspiration for her. And this idea of listening to the voice within really inspired her to write. And so this engraving shows Ralph Waldo Emerson um, in this nice suit. And we can see those penetrating eyes. She talks about all the deep stories he must have to tell. Um, but he really supported her. And she really did give her first book of poetry to him. And her second um, work of poetry, she actually dedicated to Emerson. This is a picture of Emily's family home in Rhode Island, where they used to summer. Um, Emma really did go to Rhode Island in the summertime. As you saw in the picture, um, she was writing while everyone else was kind of in the sand and playing with a kite. But we do know that Emma loved to go on walks and strolls um, through um, like the area all around Rhode Island um, by the beach and go for long walks. Um, they talked about how even though she was such a city girl, she loved to go out and um, kind of escape into the woods and take long walks. And we know that because she wrote so many poems about it. So this picture shows you the beautiful mansion that her family had um, in Rhode Island. This is the synagogue, the Toro synagogue that um, she, she again goes to in our story. Um, if you remember, she is really inspired by the space itself. So you can see in the book, those beautiful, um, beautiful rounded windows that are the same ones that you can see in this picture here. So all the light that you can see streaming into the photo is very similar to what we saw in the story um, that so inspired Emma. And we know that she visited when she was in Newport and we know it was also a very big connection with her, with her family. This is um, the immigrant shelter on Wards Island that Emma talked about in our story. Um, she really did go to Wards Island. She really did help many immigrants and refugees as they were coming in. Um, and Wards Island, as you heard in the story, was really not a place that was being um, really kept up very well for new immigrants. So Emma, through her writing, again, she told people in newspapers and through her poetry about what was happening to try to make things better for new people. This is a picture of the Statue of Liberty. Um, like we talked about at the very beginning, this was ultimately what where her poem um, lives today. Um, but this was really the inspiration for what she wrote, this beautiful goddess who's really welcoming us um, to, to this new country to make our lives and have this sense of freedom and hope. So we can see this beautiful Statue of Liberty in this picture. Finally, this is the 
beautiful um, bronze panel that has the new Colossus. Um, originally, it was on the pedestal of the Statue of Liberty, as you heard in the story, but today it's actually in the Statue of Liberty Museum. But actually, um, after the Statue of Liberty was put together and put where it is in New York City Harbor, it became almost instantly famous and iconic. And people were like, oh, you know, this is the symbol of New York, symbol of the United States. But very quickly, people forgot about her poem. And so by the early 1900s, her family decided it was really important to remember Emma. And so her family and friends actually gifted the Statue of Liberty this poem. So this bronze panel is really a gift for Emma's family in memory of her and this beautiful poem. And now we really think of the two much more connected than once upon a time we were maybe forgetting about. So with all this in mind, let's write a poem together. Um, so we're gonna be writing a haiku poem. Um, I chose a haiku because haikus tend to be shorter. Um, they're only three lines each. And a haiku is a type of Japanese poetry. So the first line has five syllables. The second line has seven syllables. And then the third line has five syllables. So you might be wondering, what's a syllable? Um, so a syllable is a unit or it's a beat. So for example, the word haiku has two beats. So haiku has two beats or the word poem, poem has two beats. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna write one together and actually I already wrote one for you and I want you to be able to guess who you think I'm talking about. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I am going to pull up my whiteboard here so that way you can see it. So I wrote this haiku for you all. And as you can see on the screen, it says 575, the, remi the reminder of how long our poem has to be with our syllables. And this is the who am I poem. So once you figure it out who it is, if you wanna just wave your fingers at the camera for me, or you can write it in the, into the chat box. It says the first line is five syllables. And then the second one, if you remember, is seven. And the last one is five. So it says, she was a poet. Statue of Liberty made her name famous. So if we did it in syllables, it was, she was a poet. The Statue of Liberty made her name famous. So who do you think it is? Lee, I see you have your hand up. Do you want to unmute yourself and tell us? Emma Lazarus. You got it, Emma Lazarus. Nice work, nice work. So what I thought we could do is we could all write a poem together, but this time about the Statue of Liberty. So I have a word bank here with some ideas because these are some of the things I think about when I hear the Statue of Liberty. I think of freedom, I think of refugees, I think of light. I think of immigrant, I think of hope, welcome, gift, friendship, but I would love to hear from you all what you think of. Um, would anybody wanna share a few words that come to their mind when they think of the Statue of Liberty? If you have an idea, you can just put your fingers at the camera or if you want, you can write it into the chat box. Somebody wrote an inspiration. Ooh, I love that, Rachel. I'm gonna add that in right now. Okay, Good inspiration. Point. And Leah wrote home. Oh, I love that, home, okay. Any and others? We have here, oh, two refugees and friends. She welcomed people. Two, refu oh, two refugees and friends, and then she welcomed people. Yeah. Oh, and every, no, no, people have some great comments coming in. And, and Megan wrote collective care and love. Oh, Megan, I love that. And Sharon wrote hope. Oh, I love hope. These are all really great words. We can take a couple more if you want. We can also start with these. Um, so if you remember, the first line has to be five syllables. So for example, the word home, that's only one syllable, even though it has four letters. 
but inspiration takes a little bit longer. Just like kind of, we have to work to find our inspiration. It takes longer with our syllables, like inspiration. So it's already four syllables. So um, some of these are gonna take longer than others. But what, what do we want for our first line? When we think of the Statue of Liberty, what's, what's the first line we wanna have? It's gonna be five syllables. Anybody have an idea? We can use any of these words, or maybe we wanna come up with something completely different. If you Roseanne want to write it wrote, into the chat box, you can. Okay. Yeah. Roseanne wrote in New York Harbor. Ooh, New York Harbor. I have a cat that's saying hello. Um, New, great. New York Harbor. Okay, New okay. York Harbor. Okay, and Deborah wrote Light of Hope to All. Light of Hope to All. Okay, so that could be our last line, right? Because those are, um, those are our five syllable ones. We need something now for our seven syllables. Ooh. Leah, I love seeing you counting your I syllables. Know. I love it. It helps me too. Refugees, that's three. Anybody have an idea what we want to do for okay. our seven Got syllable line? A symbol of hope and light. A symbol of hope and light. Oh, and I seven. love that for our seven. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. So we have New York Harbor. Ooh, I think we're a little short. Right, right, yeah. New York Harbor. <laughs> we need, ooh, can we say, we need like one more word for New York Harbor to make it five. We can make it like a New York Harbor or the New York Harbor. In, yep, we've got in, two, two people commented in. Great, in, oh, beautiful, I love the teamwork. Okay, in I wanna New give a York shout out Harbor. to Lena too, cause she had helping all that need it, that need it. Oh, I love that. I'm gonna add this in right here, um, little text box, helping all that need it. Oh, I love that. Okay, so in New York Harbor, and then this will be seven, a symbol of hope and light. Oh, it's beautiful. And then light of hope to all. This is so beautiful, everyone. Light of hope to all. That's so beautiful. Can you give yourselves a round of applause? That was awesome. I love that. All right, I think we have time for one more. If we wanna write another poem about Statue of Liberty, we can, or if, Hearing our story, but Emma Lazarus really inspired you. We can also write a poem about Emma, or we can write something about welcoming people. We have a lot of stuff here about like welcoming people, be, making friends. So if we want to write something about welcoming new people. We could do that as well. Anyone have an idea that they want to share in the chat box, or if you want to be brave and take yourself off of mute, you could share that way as well. Okay, there's a couple here, one from Leah, and she writes, welcome and inspiration. Oh, I love that, welcome and inspiration. And okay. another line that someone added, a torch of welcome. Torch of welcome, okay, there's awesome, really so a torch of welcome. I know, so oh. beautiful, Rachel. And from Lena, a torch she, of welcome. And from Lena, she wrote, she lived a great life. Oh, I love she lived a great life. She did live a great life. I agree. Um, like a lot of women at this time, many women had to get married um, because that was sort of the time. It was a belief that like if you were a young woman, you had to get married. And then her home, she actually never married. It was just she lived with her sisters and her poetry was the marriage of her life. Um, she was, her writing was all that she needed. Um, so such an inspiration. Her life was all hers and her, her imagination. Um, so a torch of welcome. So that was five. And then she lived a great life. She lived a great life. That's five as well. 
and welcome inspiration. What is this one? Welcome and inspiration. That's our sub. That's our sub. We did it. Oh, that's so good. Okay, so I'm gonna delete that for now so I can move it to the middle line. Wow, we are doing so awesome, everyone. Oh my gosh, we wrote two poems in like 10 minutes. Boop, we are amazing. Okay, so the first one was in New York Harbor, a symbol of hope and light, light of hope to all. Beautiful. And then a torch of welcome, welcome and inspiration. She lived a great life. Oh, can you give us another round of applause? That's so beautiful. I love that. Thank you all so much for writing this beautiful poetry. And I know that um, Nancy and Rachel had asked if you had paper with you and your own pen that you could write your own. So a haiku is a really fun type of poetry to write because as you saw, if you can just start writing some ideas in a word bank of some words you wanna create with, you can start writing a poem really quickly and easy. And before you know it, who knows, maybe you'll be a published author just like Emma as well. I would love though to take some questions from you all. I'm gonna take myself off of um, this screen of our whiteboard screen. And I'm just gonna take us back to our main screen together. And I just would, and before we um, end our time together, I would just love to hear if you all have any questions or if any comments you'd like to share about our time together. If you have questions or comments, you're also welcome to put them in the chat box or if you wanna be brave and unmute yourself, you can do that as well, whichever you prefer. Oh, there is a question here. Um, someone asked, why did she die so young? And yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a tough, it's a tough question. That is a really tough question. Um, we know she passed away from a disease called Hodgkin's disease. Um, and we know that actually in her last years of her life, she became so sick, she actually couldn't write. So she was able to, the last thing she did was she put together a book of her poetry with the new Colossus, the, the poem on the Statue of Liberty is like the centerpiece of it all. Um, and that was one of the last things that she was able to do. So um, her writing really continued to be her outlet, even when she couldn't physically write anymore, she was able to share and spread her word um, through publishing. And as we know, her father helped her publish her first book. Um, and only her first book came out when she was 17. Whoa. Um, but unfortunately, uh, many people at this time period did not live as long lives as most people do today. Um, she had a shorter life, but we can think of it as being a very beautiful one for sure. And I did, Alex, there was, was a question that sort of Nancy and I answered a little bit, but like someone wrote, they were a little like surprised to hear about like a very well to do Jewish family in the eight, like the 1800s. So like, do you want to give a little like backstory maybe about Emma's family? Absolutely. Um, so we know, um, as you saw in the book, you know, that Emma was very connected to um, the, the new Jewish immigrants that were coming at that time. But, you know, even though um, Emma was very connected to the story, she was not a recent Jewish immigrant herself. She was actually fourth generation American at this point, but she really had this very um, close connection. I think she was, as we saw in the story, she was very empathetic and she really felt very connected to other people, which really inspired her writing. And she really was listening to this voice within, which I, which like really came from the environment around her. But her family um, does have this very rich history. She was a Sephardic Jew. So her family came from um, Spanish and Portuguese Jewish um, Jewish ancestry over time. And so she was a Sephardic Jewish, um, Jewish girl living in New York City and they were a much more upper class family. So um, that's part of the reason why she was able to live in Union Square and why she didn't have to get married um, and didn't have to have a lot of the same things that many young girls at the same time period would have had to have responsibilities for. She could really concentrate on having a really rich education. Um, we know that she spoke multiple languages and she was able to translate beautifully all these poems. She, as we talked about, a published author um, and a, a published poet as well. Um, and um, that was, but she really had this very rich connection to her Jewish ancestry by seeing all these new Jewish immigrants, particularly coming in at that time, it really made her inspired to learn more about herself and more about her own personal history as well as those around her. Any Hi. other questions anybody has? I heard a question. Yeah. Oh, Lena, tell me about it. What do you got? Why am I get Hodgkin's? That's the name. She wanted to know how she the yeah, she wanted to know. That's a great question. I don't 
You know, I actually don't know for sure how she got Hodgkins. I know that she was traveling a lot, like we saw in the story. And when she was overseas, we know that when she came back to the United States, um, she started to get sick then. But unfortunately, a lot of people um, at this time period, it was very easy to get illnesses. And so she passed away um, rather young. But we know that, like like I told you, that she wrote really as long as she could. And she was really lucky to, ha lucky to have such support from her family um, and from her sisters as well, um, who all really stayed living together, kind of like the Bronte sisters. They all, they, most of them never married and they lived together and just wrote um, extensively. And in Emma's case, wrote poetry the rest of her life. Well, I want to thank you all so much for coming to today's event. Um, I had so much fun working with all of you. If you have other questions, um, feel free to email the museum. You can also email me as well at my um, work email, which is on the screen here, um, edelaire at newyorkcitychildrenstheater.org. Um, I work for another company when I'm not working with Museum at Elder Street, a small children's theater, and which is part of the reason why I do work in, um, as a costumed interpreter. Um, but I'm so happy that you all were able to come today and attend. And thank you so much for taking the time out of your Sunday. Um, as you can see, this is a picture of the beautiful inside of the museum at Eldridge Street. And um, oh, I got one other question in here. Did Ralph Waldo Emerson stay as her teacher? I don't believe he did stay as her teacher, but I know that he really stayed as an inspiration for the rest of her life. Like this idea that he kept giving her this idea of like listening to her heart and listening to sort of what inspired her that kept her going in her writing the rest of her life. Um, and I think she continued to read his works throughout her life. So in that way, I think he remained her teacher, but I don't think he became an active, remained an active participant as a teacher her whole life. But thank you all so much for coming. And I love some of the thank yous coming in. I'm so glad that this was such a joyous time for everyone who attended. Um, it is such a joy to be with you all today. And thank you so much for being here. Um, Rachel and Nancy, would you like to say anything before we wrap up? Yeah, just a nice comment from Sharon. They're in, from Boston, so they're very close to the Concord author. So Emerson's, you know, one of the their crew. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to everybody for joining us today. And especially thank you to Alex, um, who made this program so um, informative, so much fun. Um, and I hope that we all go off to um, our own lives with a little poetry um, in our heads too. So thank you all very much and um, hope to see you at, at our next programs. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you.